Of the many R&B girl groups of the 60s, one that slipped through the cracks were the Flirtations, and they had to move to England in the late 60s to make the mark. And we're going to hear their pop soul classics here on Pop Goes the 60s. <laughs> Relatively unknown in the States, the Flirtations originally formed in 1962 in Orangeburg, South Carolina. And the lineup consisted of Ernestine, Shirley, and Betty. They were sisters, the Pierce sisters, and their friend Lestine Johnson. After performing locally and building a solid following, the excitement of the British invasion caused them to decide to chase their dream and move to New York, which they did. And after a short while, they were signed to a record label by Old Town Records in 1964. And this is when they released their first single, Hey There, Hey There. Hey There, Hey There wasn't too great of a song, but their next single, which was written by J.J. Jackson called Jerk It, was designed to jump on the dance craze trend. Jerk It hit number 111 on Billboard's Bubbling Under chart, so that's a moderate hit. They're on their way, but despite the increasing fame and the increasing success on the charts, Lestine Johnson decided to leave the group at this time. This was 1965, and she was replaced by Alabama-born Vi Billups. The exposure of this charting single wasn't enough for Old Town to create an album at this time, so what they did is they just continued to produce singles. Now, these singles didn't really make a dent at all, but the Gypsies continued to increase their profile by playing the Apollo. They played the Brooklyn Paramount, and they had a pretty good following at this point. The problem was the flood of recent girl groups in the early 60s and the mid-60s made it very hard for them to stand out without a really big hit. You know, you had groups like the Shirelles, the Chiffons, the Marvelettes, the Crystals, and of course the Supremes. They felt that they needed to make a change at this point. So when their sister Betty left in 1966, they took the opportunity to make a big change and change their name to The Flirtations. Now this was a better fit for their image anyway. They were kind of sexy, they were very attractive, and they didn't mind flaunting it a little bit, so The Flirtations' name really fit them well. And the reputation was strong enough that they were asked to audition for Tamla Motown. And it looked like they might sign a contract with Motown, but it ended up not happening. Part of the reason was, was they didn't want to be like another... B-type Supremes group that got the second string songs and were relegated to, you know, package tours that weren't going to really promote them well, which is what happened to a lot of groups. So still enamored with England and the Beatles, they had their management book them a tour to England. So the UK welcomed them, but as they prepared for this trip, they recorded a couple more songs, but in true 60s fashion, the record company recorded two songs under the name Flotations without using them as singers. These two songs sound like supreme knockoffs and they didn't do anything, but they're, they're not bad. But the next single was much better and the group did perform these two singles in their live show.
Their trip to England was a big success and they met several movers and shakers in the industry. And they came back to the States to fulfill some engagements, but were back in England looking for management. In early 1968, the girls bumped into a duo who was looking to sign a group, basically. And this was a young songwriting pair and producers named Tony Waddington and Wayne Bickerton. And Waddington was a staff writer and producer, and Bickerton was an A&R director. And this was at DECA. Both were writers. Their boss, Dick Roll, loved the flirtations. Now, you may remember that name, Dick Roll. He's the guy that turned out the Beatles at DECA back in 1962. And there's another Beatle connection here. Uh, Waddington and Bickerton were the guys in the Pete Best band when Pete Best was thrown out of the Beatles and signed with Lee Curtis and his All-Stars. Bickerton and Waddington were in this group. And once they got rid of Lee Curtis, Bickerton and Waddington became the songwriters of the Pete Best group. And they were very young at the time, just kind of getting started. And their early writing was not very good. And the Pete Best band, which went through several different name changes through early 1966, that pretty much left them at loose ends when that all fell apart. And that's when Waddington and Bickerton got more involved at DECA in a &R and in songwriting. Now the flirtations knew they had to sound different, they had to offer something new. And what was happening at the time in England was this Northern Soul movement. There was really an outgrowth of the mod scene from 65, 66. That scene kind of musically anyway turned psychedelic. But in the northern part of England, they liked to dance. They liked their R&B songs. And this was a time when a lot of American R&B songs that weren't big hits in the States became very popular in England. And they were more designed for the dance floor. And many of these songs had really cool dance breaks, driving bass, and some nice guitar. But they still maintained a pop sound. So this, was, was, this fit in perfectly with what the flirtations were doing. Someone out there hit number 30 in the Netherlands, and this punchy beat and the nice orchestration made them a hit in Europe. And though they were based in England, they started to become bigger stars outside of England, strangely enough. But this would change with their next single. So Bickerton and Waddington, their writing had been developing since the Pete Best days. And nothing but a heartache gave the duo and the group the hit they were looking for. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we have three fabulous girls. Nothing but a heartache from the flirtation! The original B-side from late 68 had a great holiday song called Christmas Time Is Here Again. Nothing But A Heartache was a turntable hit in the UK, but surprisingly, it didn't make the charts. Now, in the United States, it got re-released with a new B-side and started to enter the charts. And there it climbed all the way to number 25 in Record World and hit number 35 in Billboard, where it spent 14 weeks on the chart. Uh, it was top 100 in Canada, Australia, and again in the Netherlands. So it was pretty much a worldwide hit, although not a super huge hit. It reached number three in the Boston market, which was the highest ranking anywhere in the States. With the hit song on their hands, an album was released both in the United States and in the UK. Now, the United States album cover is called Nothing But A Heartache, and it's got a cool psychedelic cover. This album has gotten super expensive. I wish I could find one that was affordable, but I haven't been able to yet. But now the, the British version has been re-released, and this is a different cover. And you can always notice that the fashion that these girls wore was pretty high-end. And in this case, they made the dresses for this photo shoot. And the, the, um, the songs on here, 11 out of the 12 songs are written, written by Bickerton and Waddington. So gone and stay, and we'll always be together. Have mercy, baby, take me back. Take me right back to my mama. Once I had
two songs were pulled from the album for their next single, and that's Need Your Lovin' in South Carolina. South Carolina was written specifically for, the, for them because that's the state they were from, but it only got to number 111 in the charts. Now this album is notable because the production is very tasteful. It's got some nice orchestration. There's that very British sounding driving bass for the whole thing. And there's really not any filler on this album. So that's why this album is considered a, cl a classic of some sort. While Nothing But A Heartache was breaking in the United States, the flirtations embarked on another UK tour, this time supporting Stevie Wonder. Now this was a great opportunity for them, but I think they should have worked that single as much as they could have done in the States. That would have really pushed that single, I think, higher in many markets and they would have had a much higher profile. Uh, so they, but they didn't do that. So the song actually hit without them really touring off it in the States, which is commendable. But unfortunately, that's why they probably aren't as known in the States. So the next single was called Keep On Searching. Keep On Searching was more of a pop song, but their next single was a straight ballad. You can hear they're adopting more of a smooth AM pop radio sound. The RB feel is maybe dropping away a little bit, and we hear that with this next single as well. We are now in 1971, and the last single or two didn't chart. The next single utilized two former Motown hits. One was Take Me Your Arms and Love Me by Gladys Knight and the Pips. And the other was Little Darling, I Need You by Marvin Gaye. So it's a little bit ironic they would go in this direction. This was the sound they were trying to stay away from and have more of their own independent sound that was different than Motown. But I guess they were looking to hit, and this is 1971, and they're... They're starting to try to change, change with the times, but I think they're starting to fall behind a little bit. Now in 1971, they released another album. This is called The World of the Flirtations. And this album is almost identical to the album that came out in 1970 in England with three different tracks. Three of the new tracks are three of the later singles that are on this album, which is cool, but it's, it's, it's hardly a new album. After The World of the Flirtations was released in 1972, Vi Billups left the band. She went solo to perform under the name Pearly Gates. And they added another member. And they released one single per year between 1972 and 1975. None of these songs charted. And none of those were even released in the United States. They were European only. And then they also had an album come out in 1976. Yeah, after this 1976 album, they continued to perform. Uh, that was based. Their, that was their main thing, really. They weren't into doing singles during the '70s much, or recording a whole lot. They were more about live appearances. That seemed to be their niche. But if you weren't releasing music and weren't performing in the states, obviously nobody's going to know you, and that's what happened to them. So they were pretty much just a European band in the '70s, and they eventually just after some member changes, they just kind of fizzled out. Now they did reunite in 1989 and have been performing on and off ever since. So their music has been living on. And let me just show you some of the stuff that's available to buy of them. This is a compilation, as I mentioned. It's basically a reissue of this album with three different tracks. This album is available, you can buy this now. And I think it came out last year or so. And one thing I didn't realize was that there had been a CD that was released in 2008. And this has got everything on this album, but with like five more tracks. Those late 69, 1970, those singles are on this CD. So I would have just bought this. 
This is an excellent value. And the songs are remastered off the original tapes. The sound is excellent, which you don't always get with this kind of music. Uh, one of the things I also want to mention, if you do buy this album, it comes with some great liner notes. And uh, if I can get it back in there. And the liner notes on the CD are also very extensive. The problem is, is that when I got this CD, the pages are printed in the wrong order. So it's a great story, but uh, you're going to have a trouble uh, figuring out what page comes next. I've actually put little pages on here so I can read the story chronologically. <laughs> so unfortunately, that was a printing mishap. Hopefully, that'll get corrected. So these, to buy these albums original are very expensive. expensive. As I mentioned, the American version of the first album is super expensive. I was just looking recently. It was like maybe 125 was the cheapest one I saw. It's like in the $200 range and more. So hopefully, maybe that'll get re-released at some point. I would imagine that it would. This band seems to be picking up a little bit of interest these days. I got some of my information from a guy named Andy Morton who did a great article in Shindig. So Andy, thank you for your hard work on that. That really helped me put this video together. And as I said, you can find a lot of their stuff, a lot of it's on YouTube, but if you're able to get anything, I would pick this up. It's got all the essential songs, and it's a great place to start. I just love discovering these obscure artists and pouring over their catalogs. Unfortunately, uh, the great hooks that they had in these songs just didn't catch on, and there were so many in the 60s. There was a lot of competition, so a lot of great bands and a lot of great groups fell uh, through the cracks, and I think the Flirtations are one of them. Yeah, and the fact that these are getting reissued gives me hope for uh, the future of, of this old music that it will be remembered. And I have another video that I've done on another Northern Soul artist named Lou Courtney. So I've got a video on that. I'll leave a card at the end so you can click on that video. Great stuff from Lou Courtney. As always, I thank you for watching and I'll be back to talk about some more underappreciated bands here on Pop Goes the 60s.